you know, and, and again, I just ask your listeners, they, they should watch it. And then when it's over, ask themselves, are the individuals in that jail cell who are government employees, corrections officers, a nurse, ask themselves, did we just watch a horrible crime happen? And if they say yes, then, then they need to understand that no one has been charged. Welcome to the NJ Criminal Podcast. We find ourselves back on the New Jersey Criminal Podcast. I'm with attorney Larry Wilder. And I did want to sort of recap how a couple of guys who are half a country away from each other who've not spoken before end up uh, digging into something like this. And your role in this interests me uh, a great deal. And then we should let you take that right into the story itself. So so actually, yes, we are uh, doing a lot of film festivals and uh, where myself and the young man that uh, handled the case with me go and the documentary is shown and then we'll do q and a's afterwards doing a lot of uh, podcast interviews uh, going to do the screening at the indiana public defenders uh, council annual meeting with hopefully we've contacted or they have contacted the national association of criminal defense lawyers to try to set up a screening at a national function and it, it, this all has evolved from the documentary, which when we obviously took on uh, Jared Draper's case, had no idea that we were going to, uh, it was going to evolve into a documentary that the New York Times purchased from the filmmaker and that, which subsequently became a, uh, a, a chosen, one of few chosen documentaries by a company or not a company it's it's an organization called farstaraction.org and farstar action is a a, a a group that was formed by two folks from seattle talk about across the country i mean we're we're dealing with seattle in the middle america jeffersonville and you here in new jersey but the folks that the farstar they felt like that they wanted to take this documentary take this message for change and run with it in this forum and venue. So we just uh, decided that if they were that committed to uh, trying to, to share Jared's message, trying to develop a change agent for the, uh, the circumstances that uh, surrounded Jared's death, that we certainly would uh, do whatever they ask us to do and the producer, uh, Sam Mirporian, is doing the same thing. Uh, and so this is what we, we've done. Um, the statute of limitations on a criminal case, in the, in the case involving Jared, the criminal case being a civil rights criminal case that uh, we believe the United States Attorney's Office has not looked at seriously, uh, that will expire on the eighth day of October of this year. So that's a big part of why uh, Far Star has pushed as hard as they can and as hard as they have because uh, the potential for crimes that occurred in that jail. And, and, and what I, you know, I encourage all of your listeners to watch this video documentary. And then when it is over, ask themselves if they believe they witnessed a crime happening and Jared Draper was the victim. And where we are now is, is that, uh, it's a it's a horrible horrible thing to watch, and uh, the only thing that has happened is uh, the civil case that we pursued was settled for a million dollars, and and it doesn't seem to be an, uh, enough of a result for justice. You know, money is all that you can get in civil cases, but it's surely you know. And, and again, I just ask your listeners they they should watch it, and then when it's over, ask themselves are the individuals in that jail cell who are government employees, corrections officers, a nurse, ask themselves, did we just watch a horrible crime happen? And if they say yes, then, then they need to understand that no one has been charged. And this is a good point to mention. Anyone who wants to click the link anywhere the video or the audio for our conversation right now is being posted, there's going to be front and center uh, any links that you mentioned, especially the link to 
the documentary. So anybody who chooses could stop listening to us right now, click on that, watch the documentary, and see what they think for themselves. And anybody who chooses to continue to listen, get all the details that, that you can uh, put forth uh, today in our conversation. But certainly that's front and center in the podcast post, if that's where this is being ingested, or if it's on YouTube, or if it's on the New Jersey NJCriminalPodcast.com, we will have links to the video or to the documentary. And that's what we're, that's what this is all about. Um, you know, uh, I've been practicing all 37 years and we're a suburb of Louisville, Kentucky. My practice has been primarily criminal defense and not specifically and particularly uh, civil rights cases. But when this was brought to me, uh, and, and we acquired this jail video. It just seemed like it, it, we needed to push this and go forward as hard as we could. And we did it in the civil setting, which is the only setting we had. And, and right now, what we're looking at is, uh, uh, you know, and, as you know, the United States attorney in every state determines whether they believe a crime has occurred. So in, in, in Jared's situation, he, you know, Jared was a young man uh, that was stopped. His original stop was a simple traffic offense. He uh, failed to use his turn signal. Uh, the, a pursuit began, and it was a slow speed chase. And finally, Jared gets stopped by multiple police officers in this rural community sheriff's department. And when they go to the vehicle, Jared has slit his wrists, and they take him to the hospital from the hospital, he's cleared to go back to the jail. And when he gets to the jail, uh, they do the, the jail intake. The arresting officer, and you will see in, the, in the, the documentary, the arresting officer's deposition pieces, where the arresting officer confirms that he believed Jared had ingested drugs. The arresting officer believes he told them when he brought Jared in that he'd ingested drugs. We have a young man that is now taken into the jail who's ingested drugs. We believed that if we'd gone to that trial in the civil case, it would have been clear that that message was shared to the intake. And their response was, and, he, and he's also cut his wrist. They put him in a, a, a medical uh, suicide watch, single cell in a suicide smock. He has a behavior that they determine his behavior that is destructive of jail property. He's banging on a solid steel door. So they, the jail personnel determine in their mind that under their rules, because he's banging on the door, they get to take him and put him in an emergency restraint chair. So what you see is this full video. And we had all the hours of Jared being in, incarcerated. They take this young man, they put him in a steel chair, they strap him down, five point restraints across his body, his arms are down, his legs are down, put a spit mask and a helmet on him, and he sits there for two hours. Well, during that two hours, what's happening is, is this methamphetamine that he has ingested is beginning to release into his body. They take him out of the chair, he tells the corrections officer chief the chief corrections officer who asks him questions i I've, I've been drugging because he asks him they do nothing so you have a young man who is now sweating profusely so much so you can see it on the video that we have in the videos and above the cell you can see him sweating profusely he's drinking water which is another a methamphetamine overdose sign sweating profusely, intake of water. They do nothing. He then begins to spin around in the cell and he's bouncing off and hitting walls and falling down. His suicide smock is off. He is nude. He is clearly in mental and physical distress. And the response of the jail personnel is that they believe, and this is, this is out in the, in, in the, in the deposition. When we depose the chief, corrections officer, his statement was that he believed at that point Jared Draper was just a pissed off inmate trying to get attention by spinning around, falling down, and bouncing off the walls, not uh, a human being in distress. 
they were their response to that was taking him again, putting him in this metal chair, strapping him down again, placing the spit mask and hood over him again, and then the second time in this the chair, he begins to have major physical reactions. He begins to bang his head. He begins to shake back and forth. But again, keeping in mind, he is totally and completely bound to the chair. And the nurse comes in with other corrections officers and his method of helping this suffering individual who is in clear distress, he takes a taser and he tases him. And that happens six more times. And then ultimately what you see happen is you see Jared die in a restraint chair, blood coming out of his mouth. You see through the spit mask and he died. So that was what was just so powerful to us. And that was what we pursued the civil case based upon violation of his federal civil rights. We were, we, we were conscientious enough not to try to push a criminal issue until we completed the civil case because we didn't want it to, to try to appear that we were using threats of criminal prosecution to enhance a financial recovery. And then we turned all of this over to the FBI the first time. FBI did not believe a crime occurred. And again, I just beg your listeners to watch this video and ask yourself, do you believe a crime occurred when these individual corrections officers are tasing a man strapped to a chair? And we're now in this, the second phase of the FBI investigation happened when we uh, addressed uh, uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, in, in the Civil Rights Criminal Division. And again, the second phase of the FBI investigation came back and they said, well, we don't see a civil rights case. Um, and, you know, we've got till the fourth day of October to try to get somebody to look at this. Because I think there's a flaw in the system. The flaw in the system is the federal agents in the communities where these things happen know the state agencies, the state agents. And it's difficult to tell your buddy hey, I think you committed a crime when you did these things. And it's easier to say, well, you know, we don't see anything bad that's criminal. Uh, we don't see intent. That's what they keep coming to is, well, we didn't see intent. So, you know, it's just, it's it's a horrible, horrible event. And, it's hard to watch. Oh, it's hard it, to it, watch. It, now, the first question I would have until you bring up that a medical professional is in the but the, the, the question I have, until you mention that there's a nurse, the question I have is, have any of the people in this food chain here had any background with drug treatment or drug assessment? Yeah. So, so we, uh, we got every individual's training history. And, and one of the things that we're trying to do with, with Far Star Action is trying to initiate some legislative reform as it relates to training of corrections officers. In the state of Indiana, to be a corrections officer, all you have to be is 18 years old, and then you get 40 hours of basic training in the jail that you're going to work in. So essentially in, in the state of Indiana, it, it, what we found when we deposed these corrections officers, they were all young people. They were all young people who had very little training over and above their 40 hours. And they were young people that were coming from service sector jobs like, you know, sales clerk at the Levi's store, uh, waiting tables at the, at the Cracker Barrel was their job before they became corrections officers. Then what we found was is that the training that is alleged to have taken place over the time was uh, such that when we would ask them questions by looking at the training the history, you know, you were trained to recognize excited delirium on this date for two hours. What do you, re what do you recall? Well, I don't remember anything. So it, it, so they represent in their training 
history that they're trained on recognition of excited delirium, recognition of drug overdoses, recognition of, of mental, uh, mental health problems as training uh, components. But when you depose them, the answers were, well, I don't remember that. Or, I, you know, I, and, and if they said they remember when you said, well, what did you learn? And what we found was, as we went through and got those training videos and those training manuals that they were supposed to have learned from, it's all there. Excessive sweating. You know, it, it, these are the signs of, of drug overdose. Uh, ma and massive intakes uh, of, of fluids. Uh, being and engaging in, in activities that are repetitious. And, and, and seem to lack any meaning, spinning around, falling down. So yeah, I mean, it, it, the, the, there's just a missing piece of training for corrections officers in Indiana. There's a missing piece of paying a corrections officer a, a salary. And these, these, these young people were making 12 and $15 an hour. It's a wonder it's a wonder you aren't talking to me about one of these stories every week. Well, that's a, that's a recipe for exactly what we're talking about. And it, it, by watching it, my very first impression, I watched it once at lunchtime and frankly called it a day. I haven't watched it again. Uh, but my impression takeaway was there's nobody, nobody in that room's running this operation. There's no, there's no, if this is a medical situation, there's no head medical person saying, here's what we do in this situation. And if this is a security restraint damaging the solid steel door issue with his fl fleshy hand, then it would seem to me there would likewise be a security leader dictating process and procedure. This was a goat rodeo. You would, if you didn't play the sound and all you did was watch the video, you could see that this is a shit show. Absolutely. It's a circus. And there's no, there's no rhyme or reason or methodology. I truly believe anybody who watches it without the sound can say, there's nobody in charge here. This is a free for all. And then with the sound, it, it, it certainly it doesn't come off any more convincing. You know, you're not sure if they had a whole game plan outside the door, but it's clearly discombobulated in, in application, in the room, in the chair. It's, uh, it appeared to me no one had ever been trained on anything, is what I'm saying. And when you depose them, they had the, uh, on paper, you would have thought, Everybody had had some exposure to training, but boy, when you ask them questions under oath, and we deposed everyone, and the depositions were six and seven hours, and we we walked through the video during the depositions, asking specific questions: What were you doing here? Where was your training that said this is what you do? Uh, at one point, if you take note, when I'm deposing the nurse, the nurse starts as a part of his, I'm trying to help him, um, testimony, you, you see him, the nurse taking his boot, booted foot, slamming down on Jared's unshod foot, strapped to a chair, and he's slamming down on his foot and standing up. And his theory was he was helping to calm him down and restrain him. And when I asked him, so where did you get that training? And he said, well, I, I don't know that I've ever been trained to do that. This is a guy, the nurse is a guy who had, he was the oldest fellow in the room with the most time in, in jails because he says he was a corrections officer at some times during his shift and the nurse at the other times. And, and he, you're right, he didn't know what he was doing. Hell, he's the one that's telling the young officers to tase Jared. And you're, I mean, you're right. I mean, it, it, it was a shit show and it was, it, it, you watch a man tortured to his death. Yeah, I forgot mm -hmm. about the, the, the stomping on the, the 
entirely seemingly pointless on its face act of stomping on his foot for when he's already masked, masked and restrained and, and distressed. Uh, I got a pretty good idea how I'd react to that. And it's not going to be a lowering of any of my systems activities in any way. I'm, you know, it's I'm going to be full blown fight or flight at that point, which you can't imagine is where you want to put somebody who's all jacked up on meth in a medical situation to begin with. That's patently, you know, that's egregiously, it's off the charts. I mean, I get it, it's, it stinks, it stinks of, it, it sure as hell seems criminal to me. I don't, I don't understand how it doesn't reach that. I guess it's, that's what I'm stumbling at. I, I spent 45 minutes stumbling over the fact that I just kind of want to call BS. Like, it, it's, it's what do you need to see outside of, everything being done in opposite of what should happen in that situation by people who are claiming to be trained to do the right thing and have a responsibility and, you know, to do so. And, and, and you know, one of the things that, that is bothersome, and it's bothersome because it is the system we live in as lawyers and, you, and citizens, but the the power of the United States attorney for the state that things happen in relative to prosecution of federal crimes is is profound. And in Kentucky, where we are a river separates us, in Kentucky, during the last several years, uh, it, nationally, everyone probably is, is, is will recall the Brianna Taylor case, where there was a young woman that was in her home, and there was a drug warrant to be served, and she is shot and killed uh, in her home. And then at the same time, and Jared's case predates this, there's George Floyd's um, death in, in Minneapolis. So in Kentucky, we, we started looking at, well, what gets federal prosecutions for civil rights violations in Kentucky? So in Kentucky, the United States attorney has prosecuted government actors, police officers, prosecuted them for driving down the street in their police cars and throwing milkshakes in their glass cups out at citizens. So there's two, you know, so in Kentucky, the United States attorney believes that it is a violation of someone's civil rights if the government actor throws a, a, a milkshake or there's another prosecution where a rubber bullet was fired at an individual who had a gun and it struck another person, another citizen, and that officer gets prosecuted for violating the citizen's civil rights standing near someone who actually was firing a weapon. So, so you got Kentucky. Then we went through and looked at all of the taser restraint prosecutions across the country. And there's all kinds of them. And then you look at, in Minneapolis, the federal civil rights cases were brought against the officer standing watching George Floyd's death as, as a federal crime of inaction by a government actor. But in Indiana, when you watch this video, in Indiana, the United States attorney doesn't believe that there's anything criminal that happened. That's what's so dumbfounding. And I circle back to Georgia with the Ahmaud Arbery case. You know, there, the local prosecutors decided that they didn't think a crime had occurred. Well, there the federal government steps in. And Bobby Bernstein, who is the head of civil rights criminal prosecution out of Washington, D.C., she comes in and they prosecute three individuals in for, for murder. But so, so that's another component that, that, that we deal with as a, as a country and as a, a country of citizens and independent states with federal oversight by a federal prosecutor. It's their discretion. And, and, and you know, I, I just, I, I don't get the discretion between throwing a milkshake in Kentucky and hitting somebody and torturing a man in Indiana strapped to a chair. To death. To death. By a, it, it, 
is there in and it, if this is the kind of question that isn't uh, that I'm uh, shouldn't be asking or that you shouldn't be answering, but where do you, on the scale of the participants in the room, assign blame? Because I, as a as a uh, non jurist doctorate holding um, viewer of the film, who's uh, certainly never seen a courtroom in your state, I'm thinking I'm thinking the nurse all the way, and I'm thinking that 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 the, the chief guard who's been directly informed by the victim that he's having a drug episode because that was before the nurse got involved and everybody else is anybody else is just sort of going with the flow because nobody's in charge anyway and the two people i mentioned carry the highest rank i mean the most physical the most culpability to the actual physical damage and also the most um, um dereliction of duty in not processing the concept that this prisoner has indicated that they did indeed take drugs, that there's maybe more going on here than the fact that they, uh, you know, and it, 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 this all comes just shortly after they took him to a hospital for slitting his wrists. So to be operating on under the assumption that, oh, he's just a jerk who's trying to get attention. Um, there's clearly an argument to be made that this person has demonstrated at every step of the way that there is either a drug or mental um, episode going on that anybody who's had any modicum of training whatsoever should be equipped to identify, if not at the first hint, hint being him actually telling you, by the way, which is far more than through the behavior and the physical manifestation, i.e. sweating, spinning around, walking in the walls, falling down, agitation. But your, your sort of pie chart of culpability, what does that look like? Oh, I think, I think you're absolutely right. And add to the fact that the guards, with the exception of the, 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 the commanding officer, who's the gentleman that uh, comes in and he's got black black polo shirt on everyone in uniform are young people with very little training who are looking to that nurse who's in his green medical scrubs and the fella who's the jail commander they're looking to them for direction because they don't have any training and they don't have any experience and you're absolutely right the nurse never ever took Jared's vital signs, ever. At one point, one of the officers shoves a th thermometer in his mouth after he is lit out of the restraint chair the first time. That's the, the, the absolute only medical evaluation that's done. So you've got a nurse who has 25 plus years of experience in jail facilities, and he is who calls out the first order to tase Jared and you hear him say tasing so yeah the culpability are the two individuals who are the longest standing actors in the room the jail commander testified that he had experience in the military military police was at Guantanamo Bay I mean you know in his deposition he lays out this extremely of course I did ask him about the, whether he's trained in waterboarding well, that's what I was going to say. I mean, that's a really unusual thing to bring up in your defense in this. Anybody who's watched this movie, to bring up the just the phrase Guantanamo Bay in the conversation, you are opening a avalanche of immediate thoughts in anybody's mind who sees this movie. Here's Guantanamo Bay. That's a wild, wild thing to have come up in the conversation because it's it's very it colors the conversation in a way that if you weren't openly discussing the fact that this looks a lot like torture well you might as well bring it up when guantanamo bay comes into the conversation that was absolutely one of the things we thought about when we got all his training history and the indications that that he had so, so and that is a component of a criminal charge for civil rights the, the officers standing around 
watching George Floyd die at the hands of uh, Officer Chavan, were charged based upon the the federal civil rights criminal charge of assist of not assisting but a failure to act in your capacity and duty. So you know you've got these two guys who are in charge. They're clearly not giving commands that are anything other than continue to torture him. And you've got these young, young, poorly trained, poorly paid individuals who want to be police officers. That's why they're in the corrections facilities. 90% of those young people that show up in there to become jailers, that's not their career that they want. That's not their career track. They're trying to get out on the street. So they're going to follow orders and you're in, you've, you've hit it right on the head with this incident, the two individuals that are most responsible are the two individuals who are in charge and they are dictating what is happening and they are dictating the torture occur. And, and it's just, uh, and, and how many places that don't have cameras are things as egregious as this happening across this country? What what is the what is sort of the call to action specifics in terms of uh, training or upkeep of training or resources? I mean, it seems to me I can't believe somebody hasn't invented a freaking iPad that you can't just yell a um, you know, I've got a I got a guy who's sweaty and spinning around. That iPad should be able to throw four four different drugs back at you and say. Maybe he's maybe he's not on drugs, but if he's on drugs, these are four that carry, you know, that match up on the matrix of information you provided about the case in point. The, you're, that, that's a, a great point. And so the, the call to action really kind of the first, I believe, the first level of change that has to occur uh, is, is training financially making these jobs such that people who are want to have a career go to that and that you do more than just throw them in the jail for 40 hours and say you're trained. The second phase of what needs to happen is that this investigative process that the federal government's FBI division inside that geographic area that these things are happening. The agents that are investigating whether a crime occurred in a, a jail facility are on the streets even. They are, they are law enforcement agents who deal regularly with the local law enforcement that they're investigating. And I think that, that there's a necessity, an absolute necessity that's, that you bring in outside investigators. And, and I know that, that that's a big ask because we have a lot of level layers of federal government, but it sure doesn't seem like we, you know, you don't let the fox loose in the hen house. Well, well and yeah, this, and, and there, I, there may be, there's uh, all I've heard on other topics this week, discussion of the FBI needing a review process on what they investigate and don't investigate. Um, and so, boy, I just, I, it's, it's the kind of thing where you, you, you hope you strike lightning. I mean, because you're swimming upstream. There's no way to deny the fact that if, you know, if the FBI or the state, you know, the process, federal prosecutor is not interested in, I suppose, sticking their neck out with the fellows from the golf club or the holiday party or, you know, that's a tough hill to climb. I think other than media, which you guys are doing, above and beyond um, the level that most people ever ever get involved with. I mean, you're, you're touring, you're doing interviews, you're pushing that. I, I think you're doing the right thing. Certainly going to do anything we can with our audience to you know, share the information, share the link, get eyeballs on the, uh, get eyeballs on the documentary. But there seems to be a great variance in how clearly some counties in Pennsylvania are talking about it and how some counties in Indiana or Kentucky are talking about it and, and all the other states I would imagine too. So that opens up a whole potential category of 
conversations for our podcast and um, probably a many layered onion as far as that topic goes. Yeah. And pro one of the problems we have is, is when you have this discussion, you know, the, the individuals who are, uh, are the victims of these abuses uh, like Jared, they're not extremely uh, sympathetic in the eyes of the general community because what you get is some folks who will look at that and go, well, he's a guy that swallowed drugs, so he was a drug addict, and what happened happened, and he brought it on himself. So that becomes another layer of the fight to try to help keep things like this happening. People don't think through the, the fact that jail deaths, people who are in jails, pretrial detainees, are people who are accused of crimes. And that is where the Indianapolis Star did a Pulitzer Prize winning multi-piece story about jail deaths in Indiana, going through all of these different jail deaths. And the bottom line kind of became, people are dying in jails, are dying from suicide, they're dying from drug overdoses where they get drugs in and they are dying, but there are people who are in jail waiting to be brought to court to be given their opportunity to have a trial on whether they're guilty or innocent or post bail. That's a part of it that's just so frightening to think through is that there's the, the lack of empathy. And I will say this, I'll task everybody in your listening audience right now to stop for a moment when they don't have any empathy for Jared Draper because he was using drugs. Stop for a moment and ask yourself how many of your friends, your friend's children, your own relatives or members of your family have mental health issues or use illegal drugs. When we, when we realize that this is something that hits all of us in our homes and outside of our houses and our neighborhoods, then you start to have a better feeling about, wait a minute, we got to do something. But if we can climb in our, our narrow little hole and, and say, well, you know, hell, Jared Draper was just some guy that swallowed a bag of meth and he went to jail and he, and he, and he died. And they had to strap him down. And I don't feel badly about the fact that they tased him seven times with 50,000 volts while he's screaming for his mother and calling out for God. That becomes our issue as a society and the idea that we put people away. And that's a broader, I mean, you know, that, and I hate to couch it in these terms, but that's a red and blue issue. Yeah, and I, I would, I would, I think there's an even sort of um, uh, a more individual issue with it where a lot of, a lot of people have not taken much time or been exposed to what the justice system in the United States is. And by that, I mean what it's, what it's designed to be and how truly important that attitude that, that they would display, the, just that little lack of empathy. What they don't realize is that actually is, is very it, it, entirely contrary to the premise of what makes us a far better country than most in terms of justice. And I can't really think of many places where you're innocent till proven guilty. There's, there's civilized countries where you're guilty till proven innocent, for goodness sake. People who are sitting, that's what they're not appreciating, is that that, that sort of quick-to-judge attitude, what it actually does is betray a complete and utter lack of understanding of the system in which they're supposed to reside and the system that they're supposed to appreciate more than any other. I, I feel that not having a true understanding of what the rule book is in the United States around the legal system is, is just a sin. Because I think if people did, you'd hear an entirely different conversation around a lot of the sort of hyperbolic news and crime-related stories. And to be frank, if you paid attention to the courts and read some case law and you were interested in precedent, you don't have to watch the news because you know how a lot of stuff is going to turn out anyway. So it sort of puts you above the fray. 
And that's what these people are missing out on. Anybody who's silly enough to prejudge in a conversation about a criminal and say, oh, well, they were a scumbag most of the time, who cares? What they're actually doing is they're kind of desecrating that whole premise, which is actually like the most beautiful premise we've got. I can tell you, I've tried over 200 jury trials in 37 years. And in the criminal cases, one of the things that during voir dire, our jury selection, uh, uh, one of my questions always is, you know, who here on the, who here among you all believe that uh, we, my client, we've got to give put on evidence to prove we're innocent. In the in the number of folks that just will say, oh yeah, I mean, no concept or idea that you have to presume everyone that sits in a courtroom accused as innocent. And I, I asked her, and I asked them, saying, your heart of hearts, can you promise me every day we walk in here, you're going to look over here and you're going to see Tom sitting next to me. And in your mind and in your, and I'm going to ask you to whisper, there sits an innocent man. Can you do it? Now, you know, most folks will tell you that they can after you go through all that, but it's hard to, you don't change people's attitudes. And, uh, and I've tried cases all over the country, and I will tell you regional attitudes uh, they exist, and presumption of innocence in, in uh, eastern Kentucky means something different than the presumption of innocence in Newport Beach, California. But it's there, and we got to appreciate and understand it. And the one last thing I kind of wanted to also point out is, is, you know, folks don't watch the, the documentary. The other thing that's important to take note in this situation with Jared Draper is the color of everyone's skin in that room. This is not a racial issue where you have a, a minority who is in that restraint chair that's being tortured by another race of, uh, of folks. These were all Caucasian, Southern Indiana, Northern Kentucky people. And that's what we also shook our heads about. This is just a lack of humanity. Well, and the arresting officer was black. So at the <laughs> So the he, he, he was the most he, honest guy. He was the most honest guy during depositions. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. But yeah. I, that's one of the reasons I immediately wanted to engage with you and do the interview was because because the victim was white and there wasn't going to be, any, we could just talk about the law, and that was. That was very appealing to me as someone who produces legal podcasts for lawyers and law firms and for legal history and true crime. It's like, wow, we get to get really bare bones facts, issues, outcomes. And I think I think this is a very because of that, you know, it's a very sort of what's the word, crisp message, like this could be anybody. Exactly. You know, for sure. There, there's no, there's no outside noise that you, that, you know, it's, you can't call it race. You can't call it uh, anything other than this was a lack of humanity in that room among a group of people who look the same. And, you know, the other thing that it, it's not pointed out in the documentary, but is very critical too. Dr. Smock, who speaks in the documentary about his observations that are very chilling as a, as a, a physician watching that. Dr. Smock testified at the George Floyd prosecutions of the police officers. He is the physician for the Louisville Police Department. And so what we have here in one of the interviews that wasn't used by the producer that I saw was a former FBI agent. So in this particular case, we have people who are, who are, you know, the, the thin blue line that are the, the police supporters who, who are saying this is wrong. This man was tortured. He should have never been tortured. And this is a crime, which also just kind of begs the question of please watch this. Please watch it and ask yourself if you're seeing a crime can take place. It's just really, truly mind-boggling to, to have anyone watch that and not come up with a crime. Yeah. I'm not saying your list has to match mine. 
I'm not saying, you know, I might come up to your score club, but for the love of Pete, you're going to tell me you watched that and you found nothing that 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 there's a a, 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 a grand jury or, or to come right from the from the uh, federal prosecutor. What's the process for that? So so at, at this juncture, the local prosecutor, who's a fine young man who I really really like, out of the gate, he determined that he did not believe that there was a state crime that he could prosecute, and he passed on his his decision to the Indiana State Police, who conducted no investigation. So ultimately, the first look. Uh, was the uh, first level of the FBI. And the FBI agents that looked at it, and, and I, they got all of my depositions, all of the video, everything. The first pass, they said they didn't think that they had witnessed any criminal conduct. And then we made a little noise and contacted the folks in Washington, D.C. A second look was, was uh, taken by Indiana FBI agents. And they uh, contacted us reluctantly after weeks and weeks and weeks. And they said, well, you know, we don't believe that there was any criminal conduct that we can uh, recommend this to the U.S. attorney. A uh, young, uh, young assistant U.S. attorney would not put in writing that he had the, that they had determined that there was no, uh, no crime, no criminal conduct. And right now we are struggling to try to get uh, through uh, the uh, FI open, open records through the FBI to get the whole file and it's been uh, several months and we've received nothing and no, no response to that request. So, you know, essentially the statute of limitations on federal civil rights cases is five years. Jared, Jared's, uh, he was, his rights were violated on uh, October the 4th, 2023, or excuse me, 2018 and 2023 is the statute. So we're down to, probably uh, 115, 120 days. In, in 120 days, the crimes that you watch occur in that documentary that we believe occurred, uh, the individuals who are involved will, can, can never be prosecuted because statute of limitations is run. Wow, that's a wild, that's a wild, everybody sort of dragged their feet and nobody has to take the full blame dissipation of responsibility. I can see how easy it is for them to sort of, uh, even on the FOIA request, if they drag their feet on five, five months on FOIA request, well, geez, oh, yeah. oh shoot, yeah. what a shame. We, yeah. And one other thing, you know, you, your, your listeners are probably folks who are willing to go deep and, and, and dig in I, I would also suggest if you want to get a flavor of the distinctions that go with prosecution of federal civil rights crimes, the, the United States attorney, the federal government has a website where you can Google it, go to it. Then there are news releases of all prosecutions and you can search them and just go in and search taser. And all the cases that have been prosecuted throughout the country roll up when the word taser is in them and just start reading them and read the things that have been prosecuted, read the sentences these individuals who were convicted are pled to these crimes, and then think back at the, what you saw in, in the documentary. Yeah. And it, it, you'll shake your head. Well, you gave a couple examples that had me shaking my head already. I've been shaking my head since I watched the documentary, to, to, to be frank. And I'll tell you what, Larry, it's, uh, you've got an open invite to come back anytime you want. Thank you. If, if, if there's in the next five months, if a, a little extra soapbox and megaphone or an update to the messaging is worth getting out there, uh, we'll certainly do everything we can with the production of, of this conversation to uh, make noise and, and get views and uh, make sure that the links are there. We'll do whatever we can to uh, make a splash with it and try and get some attention towards it. But if at any point in time we can be useful to you, we're, we're at your service. Well, we appreciate it and, and thank you so much. And again, you know, just everybody that's watching this and listening to this, go watch the documentary. Uh, and then when you go, when you sit down afterwards, because I'm going to tell you, and you agree with me, Tommy, it is it is emotional, it is chilling, and then circle back and look at some of the things we've discussed with, this is not a crime, 
and and you know think of ways you can do something for us change.org there's a petition sign it then do what you can and and farstaraction.org you can go there and, and send them a message but it, it, yeah the strength of this country rest upon the strength of the justice system the strength of the justice system is the treatment of each of us whether we're accused or we are the accusers to treat one another like humans and we cannot let it continue to to dissolve into a us versus them and we can do any damn thing we want to to them when we have them under our control and we just can't keep can't keep letting this happen